Good morning. This is Horizons Middle East and Africa. Our top stories this morning. The Bank of Japan holds rates after July's surprise hike, signaling it is in no rush to raise as policymakers monitor financial markets. Global stocks rally after soft U.S. jobless claims data backs the view of achieving a soft landing. The S&P hits its 39th record high this year alone. Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah calls Israel's suspected attacks using telecom devices a huge security and humanitarian blow, adding that the only way Israelis can return to the north is by ending the war. Meanwhile, during his speech, multiple reports of Israeli warplanes over Beirut. It has just gone 8 a.m. across the Emirates. I'm Jemana Brissetchi. In Dubai, we are capping off quite an eventful week. So much to digest on the geopolitical front, all of the news coming out of the region, and, of course, multiple back-to-back -back central bank decisions, uh, with the Fed being the main driver for risky assets this week. And what we saw... Guess what? Another record high for the S&P, the 39th record high of the year. Markets seem to have loved what the Fed delivered on earlier this week. 50 basis point cut, but signals that they're going to go more cautious ahead. And what we saw is a, a, a suite of green on Wall Street yesterday. Today, S&P leaning slightly towards negative. Doesn't really matter because once more, we are very close or at record highs. Brent also has been in focus this week. Uh, and we are actually looking like a weekly gain. This would be the first weekly gain for crudes uh, if you go all the way back to February. So uh, we are seeing some support come through and you've got to think some of that is on back of, again, the concerns about the geopolitics of the region here. Gold, I'm also flagging today. We're up two tenths of percent. Why? Another all-time high for gold. So we talk about... Um, the, the surprising move in gold, given some of the strength, uh, some of the uh, strength that has transpired in the USD since that Fed decision. So interesting to note. And then Asia Pacific, the handover positive overnight as well, up 1.3 percent. But we did get another central bank decision just in the last couple of hours, and that is the Bank of Japan. The setup, of course, going into it is that core CPI has been rising for four months in a row. And yet, the Bank of Japan stood pat. They kept its key rate steady as expected. And markets are now waiting for Governor Kazuo Uda's uh, briefing for hints on future policy. That's going to happen uh, in a couple of hours. But let's get you to Tokyo and bring in Sherry Ann, co-anchor of the Asia Trade, for more. So they didn't hike interest rates. Uh, so what were the key takeaways from the Bank of Japan's decision? Yeah, I mean, as expected, we saw the Bank of Japan keep rates steady. But what we were really focusing on was sort of the narrative around keeping rates steady, right? I mean, we were focused on the statement when it came to the BOJ saying that it's necessary to pay attention to the financial and foreign exchange markets because they will impact economic activity in Japan as well as prices. We had already sort of seen that narrative come out of BOJ board members throughout the past couple of weeks talking about the importance of volatility in the financial markets and how that affects the inflation outlook. Not surprising given what happened after the July 31st meeting when they hiked rates for the second time this year and that hike was unexpected. And the hawkish rhetoric coming from Governor Ueda also spooked markets. And we saw the yen surging. We saw those carry trades unwinding around the world and really contributing to that global financial meltdown. But right now, the focus has been on the improving consumer spending picture across Japan as well. BOJ officials emphasizing that that has improved and really expecting to see a virtuous cycle when it comes to the translation of income to spending. So, okay, so that was the decision. Uh, wh what are markets going to be watching out for when Ueda actually delivers his press conference? What sort of clues are we going to glean about the path ahead, given some of the cautiousness that you just described now? Jimana, we really don't want to be in Governor Ueda's shoes today, do we? I mean, it's such a tricky <laughs> way of having to choreograph this messaging because we really have seen the volatility that he's caused from his comments in the past when the yen plunged because he downplayed the yen weakness back in April. Then the yen surged because he went the opposite direction in the July meeting. What he'll want to do is really carefully choreograph tightening to come, continue to see rate hikes, but in a gradual manner without really making the yen appreciate sharply. And we have seen that choreography sort of playing out with board members speaking uh, in the past few days. We'll continue to watch what they say around uncertainties. Uh, because of uh, the global economy, also uh, what they say in terms of more rate hikes to come and really uh, that reference in the July uh, press
press conference was one that really sent investors uh, to really uh, invest on the yen because they thought that it was going to appreciate further. More than half of economists right now yeah. think that the Bank of Japan will hike rates in December, but Bloomberg Economics now expects it in October because of higher wages and prices. Yeah, that's exactly what we were just taking a look at. The fact that core CPI has been rising for four months in a row. And what's interesting is that if you look at all of these global central banks, inflation rates seem to be converging around 2%, but some have used that as a pretext to start cutting and others potentially hiking, like the Bank of Japan. Sherry Ann, co-anchor of the Asia Trade in Tokyo, thank you so much for the recap. Now, the Bank of Japan is the last of the major central banks to make a policy call this week. We also had the Fed and Bank of England decisions uh, earlier, with the Fed starting the unwind of its historic tightening campaign. Let's bring in Rafael Bertoni, head of dead capital markets at the Gulf Investment Corporation. Uh, good morning. I just want to start with you on the market's price action since that Fed decision. Another record high for the S&P. Tech stocks seem to love it. Uh, we're back to a Goldilocks, Goldilocks scenario again. What do you make of of the market's interpretation uh, of the Fed meeting this week. Good morning, Jumana. Uh, absolutely, what um, what the, the the financial conditions at the moment after the the, 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 the decision of the Fed uh, is making uh, is very supportive for uh, risky assets in general. Uh, we are in an environment where the economy is avoiding recession uh, and uh, the monetary po the, the fiscal policy is still very supportive. And the monetary policy is starting to be more accommodative. So the market cannot ask more than that. Uh, we can argue that uh, lots is already priced and, uh, and going forward, the upside is, uh, is more limited. Let me unpack one of the things that you just said there and that you think uh, monetary policy obviously is going to become easier. But then you also uh, refer to an easier fiscal policy. And that seems to be contrary to other perspectives that I've heard, because most people seem to think that in the U.S. next year, there will be no option but to see a tighter fiscal policy because of the budget pressures. Why do you think that fiscal loose fiscal policy is going to stay with us? Um, it, it's what the, the two uh, candidates uh, are, are promising at the moment. Uh, obviously, uh, what they can deliver is different from what they can promise during the campaign. Uh, but uh, if we look at uh, what the Republican uh, candidate is, is uh, um, proposing at the moment, uh, is really a, a massive I increase in, in fiscal spending. Uh, someone has calculated that uh, all the promises would uh, account for about eight trillion. Uh, even if they would deliver, uh, you know, fifty percent of what they are promising at the moment, uh, it, it, it would mean that uh, the fiscal policy re will remain very accommodative. Obviously, there is a limit. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, budget deficit, uh, but there is no doubt that, that the fiscal uh, policy going forward will, will continue to be accommodative. Mm. If I look at what the market is pricing in now, uh, by end of 2025, we've got the rate ending up or priced in at 2.85%. The dots yesterday showed that uh, the median expects uh, the, those, that rate to be at 3% by the end of 2025. So the market is slightly overshooting versus the dots. Do you think there is scope for markets to be disappointed on the pace of the rate cuts coming out of the Fed? Absolutely. Um, we, we think that the market is pricing uh, too much at the moment and uh, that the terminal rate should be something around the 3.5%. Uh, uh, even on the long end, uh, we believe that the 10-year the, the, the Treasury below 4% is, is in, in an overbought uh, um, camp. Uh, and therefore, as I said, the, there is a limited upside for, uh, for fixed income assets in general. Uh, after being long of duration, now we are we are, we have moved to a, a, a shorter duration position, and we will take any mm. further again in the bond market as an opportunity to shorten the duration more. Interesting. Which part of the curve are you shorting, and where do you think we end up? 
the, the long end is the, the one that is more overpriced at the moment. So we prefer the short end and the intermediate part of the curve uh, uh, for, for, uh, yeah. for, uh, um, for the treasury market. And we continue to overweight credit. Yeah. The credit uh, will perform better than, uh, than treasury in our view. All right. Very clear. Raffaele Bertoni, head of debt capital markets at the Gulf Investment Corporation. Thank you so much for giving us your views today. Well, still ahead, Israel and Hezbollah trade fresh strikes as the militant group's leaders uh, vows re retaliation for this week's deadly devices attacks. We are live in Jerusalem next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Horizons Middle East and Africa. I'm Jumana Bersachi in Dubai. AP is reporting that Hezbollah and Israel have launched fresh attacks across the Lebanese border. It came as the militant group's leader, Hassan Nasrallah, spoke for the first time since the mass explosions of telecom devices in Lebanon and Syria killed at least 37 people and wounded 3,000. During Nasrallah's speech, multiple reports that Israeli warplanes flew low over Beirut and broke the sound barrier. Israel also says it struck hundreds of rocket launchers and other Hezbollah infrastructure in the south of Lebanon. Meanwhile, Nasrallah described the device's blast as a severe blow and vowed retaliation against Israel. He also said the attacks don't change his group's position on the war in Gaza. So for more on this, Bloomberg's Dan Williams joins me from uh, Jerusalem. Uh, Dan, uh, just give us a sense of what the reaction within Israel has been to Hezbollah's, to Hassan Nasrallah's speech. Well, given that uh, Israel never took responsibility formally for this uh, really unprecedented telecom sabotage in Lebanon, um, but nonetheless, many Israelis assumed it was their side that did it. I think everyone was watching to see whether Nasrallah would announce a major rethink of Hezbollah's strategy. It would appear that whoever did this sabotage, and let's assume it was Israel, was hoping A, to impair Hezbollah fighting capacity, and B, to cause a major rethink of Hezbollah's strategy. Hezbollah has been attacking Israel since the day after the Gaza war erupted. There's been uh, responsive Israeli strikes in Lebanon. So we're talking about more than 11 months of a front that has really been heating up into a full war. But important to note here, of course, that many uh, within Israel would have been watching the speak and just to pick up on what Dan was saying, uh, many were looking to hear from Hassan Nasrallah. This is the first time that the uh, leader of Hezbollah speaks since those telecom incidents happened and since the explosions. And instead of backing down, he did vow retaliation. Now, what form that is going to take remains to be unknown. But what we do know from uh, the Israeli perspective is the defense minister, Yoav Gallant, just this week said that the center of gravity of the war is now shifting up to the north. So certainly still a lot of focus on the region and the dynamics that are playing out right now between Lebanon and uh, Israel. Now, UAE President Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed will be making his first trip to Washington as the country's ruler next week. He is set to hold discussions with President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris and meet with executives of large U.S.-based firms. While the leaders are likely to discuss the developing conflict in the Middle East, a UAE diplomatic advisor says the main goal is to bring up partnerships in AI and technology. And coming up, the World Bank's $90 billion plan to electrify Africa is underway. The Rockefeller Foundation is joining forces with prominent climate organizations to keep the lights on. We hear from the fund next. This is Bloomberg. This is going to take a, a, a lot of coordinated action from both the private sector as well as the public sector. And when I talk about the public sector, obviously, first and foremost, is governments in Africa who want to deliver reliable, clean electricity to their residents, to their businesses in order to spur economic growth. Look, I mean, Africa has a historical 
contribution to climate emissions of just 3%. It has massive needs in terms of energy in order to grow the economy. This is going to create opportunities for businesses both internationally as well as domestically to be part of that growth story. And so when we talk about electrifying the continent, it is really about moving the economy forward in a way that we haven't seen in the last 20 or 30 years and, and taking advantage of the opportunity that the new technologies to do with solar technology, wind, battery storage, et cetera, can bring, not unlike the way mobile telephony did, you know, 15 to 20 years ago on the continent. And talk to us about uh, how this is actually going to be deployed across the continent, because um, you talk about how you've identified some of those projects. Uh, where are they and, and how did you decide on these being uh, the, the initial projects to get off the ground with? So the, 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 the idea of Mission 300 to electrify 300 million people uh, across Africa is, is not confined to any one particular or any subset of countries. It is open to all the economies of Africa where there is still an access gap or a significant gap in terms of the number of people electrified. That said, between the World Bank and the African Development Bank, that are the two major public investors into this effort, uh, they have identified about 15 initial priority countries uh, that will be first movers, if you like. Uh, that is everything from countries as large as Nigeria, where you have close to 100 million people unelectrified, to smaller economies like Malawi or Liberia, anywhere where there is a major access deficit and where there is a level of political will and commitment to addressing the challenge. So it's not about sort of picking countries, but rather about going where there is momentum, where we can move quickly, and then hopefully very quickly expanding it to many other places. So you have a combination of some projects that are already underway. A great example is the World Bank recently approved something called the DARES initiative in Nigeria, where they're putting about $750 million of grant capital in, in order to attract private investment to provide electricity through both distributed as well as grid extension. That will reach 17 and a half million people over the next five years. So that's a very significant example of the kinds of projects that Mission 300 seeks to spur. That was Ashwin Dial, who heads the Rockefeller Foundation's Power and Climate Program, speaking exclusively to Bloomberg's Jennifer Zabazaja. Happy to say that Jennifer joins us now from Johannesburg. Uh, Jen, so who are some of the partners involved in this pledge that uh, you were just uh, speaking about with the Rockefeller? Right, Jumana. I mean, we heard Ashwin there talking about some of the public uh, investors that they have there at the African Development Bank, obviously uh, the World Bank. But it's interesting if you take a look at some of the organizations that are also a part of this pledge. And this is just the initial uh, partners uh, right now. So we have obviously the Global Alliance for People and Planet and Sustainability Energy for All. Uh, there's also uh, foundations like the IKEA Foundation and the Bezos Earth Fund uh, that are taking part in this initial one. And what was interesting when we spoke with Ashwin, uh, is that he uh, told us that there are a lot of other uh, investors potentially interested in the long term. He talked about a number of them uh, being uh, located where you are in the Middle East and also just globally, uh, many people seeing the need and the opportunity that exists here, uh, but still wanting to get to the heart of some of the I issues and the, and the concerns that there have been in the past uh, around investing in some of these projects. But definitely he believes that um, there is a, a long uh, list of people who will continue to join this pledge uh, because they have a, a goal for $90 million uh, in a few years. Mm. And how do they plan to mitigate the risks involved in, in this kind of endeavor? And this was something we, we wanted to speak to Ashvin about because, you know, a lot of times on the continent, we talk about the number of projects that are started, uh, but the issue always becomes uh, seeing them all the way through, right? Uh, they get off the ground, but it's seeing them through. And, and that's really where uh, a lot of investors have, and Ashvin shared this with us, expressed concern in particular about getting involved. And so they have uh, talked about, uh, they have a joint governance body that is looking into some of the risks uh, that have happened in the past with some of 
these projects. Uh, they're also trying to come up with the right mechanisms uh, to get around some of the currency risks, uh, potentially in investing in different parts of the continent, uh, and also ensuring that the public sector is a part of this, because he did continue to stress that, yes, this is the private sector mobilizing capital, uh, but the only way that things are going to actually get done is if the public sector has the political will, he said that a few times to me, the political will to see things through uh, and to ensure that we see some of these projects uh, actually getting the help and the support and the regulation that they need. So still a, a lot to overcome, but this is significant uh, that they've been able to mobilize this capital, especially for a continent uh, that really does need to be electrified to help boost the economy and, and um, you know, increase jobs. And Jen, what is the uh, long-term potential they actually see for a project like this? Clearly, there's a lot of focus on investment, on bringing in other partners, yeah. but uh, what are they looking to extract from this? What is the long-term return on investment potential? Exactly. And that is kind of to the heart of it, Jumana, because these investors, as much as this is a moral need and a good thing to do, they are not getting into it just for that reason, right? They are looking for bankable projects. And so Ashvin walked us through a few of the projects that they've identified. And they're saying that this is not necessarily going to be targeted to just a few of the countries that they've initially come out with this pledge. They are hoping that more countries, more projects, uh, continue to surface that they can invest in. Uh, but again, they, they see a need uh, to make sure that a lot of these projects are bankable uh, and they can actually get electricity to people because uh, this is a, a continent that is suffering from some of the worst uh, electricity depletions uh, for, their, um, for their citizens, excuse me. And, and so the opportunity is, is there for the economies themselves, for the businesses, for the entrepreneurs who are potentially starting this. Uh, and therefore, um, he sees this translating to the global economy because, of course, this is the youngest. Uh, the population is, is one of the youngest in the world. Uh, they are going to be the workforce of the future. So getting this continent electrified and connected uh, is going to be beneficial for, for more people than, than just here on Africa. Yeah. Uh, Bloomberg, such an uh, Bloomberg, Jen, such an important story. That was Bloomberg's Africa correspondent, Jennifer Zavazaja. And we'll be back with you shortly to talk more about uh, another central bank decision. But now for a look, a look at some of the other stories that we're following. The U.S. has committed more than $80 million in funding under a new program to help grow agricultural output in three southern African nations. The investment in Zambia, Malawi and Tanzania brings total U.S. commitments to the region under its Feed the Future program to $577 million. The countries were chosen for their abundant arable land and potential to supply food to the broader region. And a quick look at equity futures before we head to the break. It is a risk-on session. Uh, well, no longer. We are dipping to the red now. So we'll talk more about what's been going on in just a few moments. We also will be talking about the Bank of Japan with Aberdeen. We'll be right back. Good morning. This is Horizons Middle East and Africa, our top stories this morning. The Bank of Japan holds rates after July's hike, signaling it is in no rush to raise as policymakers monitor financial markets. Global stocks rally after soft U.S. jobless claims data backs the view of achieving a soft landing. The S&P hits its 39th record high this year alone. Plus, we discuss the South African Reserve Bank's 25 basis point cuts as inflation softens in a positive sign for the economy. It has just gone 8.30 a.m. across the Emirates. I'm Jumana Versace in Dubai. And as we've been talking about, it has been quite the week, uh, but a good week for markets. Uh, coming off a very strong week indeed, the 39th record high just for this year alone for the S&P. And so we talk about the potential headwinds of uh, too much hype in the market, the concentration around AI, what uh, the Fed is going to do, geopolitical headwinds. And yet, despite all of that, stock markets keep going from strength to strength. And today, we are slipping somewhat, though, in sentiment. S&P futures tilting slightly towards the red, but only marginally so, down about a tenth of a percent. Also in focus, Brent, even though we're down about two tenths of a percent right now, we are back 
close to $75, so tracking gains for the week. This would be the first weekly gain for energy uh, since February, actually. So uh, that just tells you how bearish the price action has been over the course of the last couple of months. Gold also in focus, another all-time high uh, for the safe haven. And then Asia-Pacific, uh, overnight, the handover has been quite positive, up 1.3%. But uh, we had another central bank meeting uh, come through with its decision a short while ago, the Bank of Japan. And while they decided to keep rates on hold, certainly there are expectations building once more in the market that perhaps they could hike again as soon as December this year. Bloomberg Economics think they could go again as soon as October. Why? The justification is that core CPI has been rising for four months in a row. So to talk about the reaction in Asian markets, Yvonne Mann joins us from Hong Kong. Obviously, the Bank of Japan a focus, but then we've also had this very strong handover from Wall Street overnight, too. Yeah, and certainly you're seeing that in Japan markets here. So it took some time to digest what we heard in that statement, but we're just two hours away from Governor Ueda's presser in Tokyo. And that's the one thing to watch the next few hours or so. Just given what we've seen in dollar yen, a bit of whipsaw there initially, it was weakening. And then as we assess this statement, it seems like traders are willing to buy up uh, the yen here leading up to this presser because there is speculation of just how hawkish Governor Ueda is going to be. That statement that we got was quite bullish on the economic outlook. They talk about how growth is above a potential to talk about raising their assessment when it comes to consumer spending but a lot of it had to do with the market volatility as well that there were some concerns that that could impact the economy as well so may he be a little bit more cautious about that as well, given what we saw, the turmoil that came from that July hike just a few months ago. Nevertheless, when it comes to Asia and risk assets here today, they're continuing with this party 24 hours after the Fed. And you're seeing, you know, Asian currencies are certainly <laughs> continuing uh, there this morning here at a 16-month high for the Asia dollar index. Dollar China as well, we're at 704 levels. That brings us back to the strongest levels we've seen since May of 2023. And you're seeing, you know, assets like tech very much catching a bit here this morning, especially when it comes to Hong Kong. We're up about close to 2%. What's driving that is going to be the EV stocks, if you see here today. This is given what we've been hearing from the EU and China. Those talks in Brussels seem to be progressing, right? They're intensifying these tariff discussions to try to avoid that tariff vote and that deadline that is looming here right now. And we're watching property very closely, Jumana, here. A Bloomberg scoop with China weighing, removing some of those major home buying curbs to boost demand, the likes of Shumel property up some 8%. Mm, interesting. It's a rare day when you see these EV uh, stocks actually outperforming the market. So again, geopolit geopolitics uh, really being factored in there. Yvonne Mann in Hong Kong, thank you so much for the overview. Well, the Bank of Japan did keep its key rate steady, as expected, signaling it sees no need to hurry with hikes. Now, markets are waiting for Governor Kazuo Ueda's briefing for hints on future policy. That happens in a couple of hours. But for now, let's bring in Kenneth Akintewe, the head of Asian sovereign debt at Aberdeen, who joins us from Singapore. Uh, your thoughts on what we had from what we heard from the Bank of Japan. The market was not expecting them to go for an interest rate hike at this meeting. Uh, do you have a sense for when the next hike uh, could be expected from the Bank of Japan? I think with the, uh, first of all, good morning to you. Uh, I think with the trajectory of inflation, generally we are anticipating uh, that uh, they will need to hike uh, by the end of the, the year in order to begin to stabilize inflation. It's kind of understandable that they maybe wanted to pause at this one. The volatility caused uh, by the last change in policy was quite significant. I mean, for ourselves, we're actually Asia X Japan investors, but we watch it very closely because that had a marked impact across our markets as well. So maybe potentially looking at uh, just uh, avoiding some further volatility. The other key thing going on at the moment is we are uh, going through the LDP elections and there's quite a mix in terms of the leading candidates in terms of their views on uh, monetary policy as well. So potentially you also want to get to the other side of mm. those elections uh, before also making some further monetary policy decisions. In terms of the leading candidates, you know, Ishiba, for example, would probably favor more hawkish uh, policy. Uh, Taichi instead would probably favor more dovish policy. So it's very, very mixed views in terms of their assessments of what kind of monetary policy framework or footing is needed for the economy. Yeah. 
Yeah, I thought a central bank's target is to achieve price stability and to ensure that inflation stays close to their price stability target. Why are they placing so much emphasis on market gyrations and market volatility? So to the extent that in any economy, when you have uh, undue market volatility, it can impact things like uh, consumer sentiment, consumption. Uh, and so maybe it was the extent of the market volatility that caused uh, a little bit of a, a, a pause for concern. I mean, I would say time is on their side. They're, they're not necessarily behind the curve. So as long as they keep the momentum and policy normalization going uh, through this year, then um, they wouldn't necessarily be running any major uh, risks. There are still arguments as to uh, whether uh, the inflation target has actually been sustainably uh, hit. Um, of course, only that will only play out and time will tell. Um, but yeah, we would, we would be more worried if we didn't see further um, uh, policy hikes by, by year end. Yeah. And uh, let me turn to the other major central bank decision this week, and that is the Fed, the 50 basis point cut. What sort of ramifications is that going to have on Asian central banks and their own cutting cycles? This is really significant for Asia because Asia has been a very different place from other global central banks and particularly central banks within broader emerging markets. You would also have noted, for example, uh, in the last week, uh, the central bank in Brazil actually having to hike interest rates because of inflationary issues. This is not the case in Asia. Inflation has actually generally for most central banks been on target for quite a while. But the thing that has kept them uh, held back from actually beginning to cut rates was concerns that the Fed was going to remain hawkish and those interest rate differentials could prove uh, damaging for uh, Asian currencies. So now that you have a Fed that's not only easing, but quite rightly easing uh, a bit more aggressively, uh, having arguably maybe been running a slight risk of falling behind the curve if they haven't already, uh, that does open the way for Asian central yeah. banks to cut rates. And ahead, ahead of the Fed, we already saw Philippines cut, the Bank Indonesia cut, and we do expect other central banks to follow through. And in, not, in all case, not in every case, do we see bond markets where this is actually priced in? So clearly on the bond market side, yeah. uh, there are attractive valuations in some of these markets. Yeah. Well, you talk about bond markets. There's one bond market I've been tracking quite closely, and those are, are China bond deals. They keep marching lower. I wonder to what extent that is uh, tying the, the PBOC's hands, because uh, on one hand, they, they want to do something to uh, stop these yields from continuing to trend lower. But at the same time, there obviously is pressure uh, to bring about some form of easing, credit easing to the economy. How do you think they're going to balance the two? So there's some interesting debate around that. It might not be that it's necessarily the level of yields that has been an issue, but it could have been that it was the shape of the yield curve. And you have seen uh, the curve normalizing with short dated yields falling so that the curve is uh, maybe at a level that's uh, more comfortable for the PBOC. And we have seen them step back from uh, intervention since that has happened, and yields have been actually uh, resuming some some downward uh, direction more recent more recently. So maybe that uh, sort of concern uh, that they were previously ex ex expressing has slightly alleviated. Certainly, in terms of economic performance, uh, it was a slight aberration to see them being concerned about the level of rates because clearly the economy is under considerable pressure. Property market consumption, uh, you know, M1 money supply. Everything is telling you that this economy is slowing uh, in the third quarter and could be below the 5% target and putting that 5% growth target at risk. So clearly, uh, easier policy is needed, even though in terms of the LPR and, and other key interest rates, we're not seeing them uh, cutting those uh, rates at uh, the, uh, recent re uh, meetings this week. Yeah, yeah, so interesting and certainly very important for the di direction of travel. Uh, Kenneth Akintewi, head of Asian sovereign debt at Aberdeen, thanks for joining us. Well, coming up, South Africa's central bank cuts interest rates for the first time since 2020. More on this next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Horizons Middle East and Africa. I'm Jumana Versace in Dubai. In Kenya, trash-eating flies, which can process organic waste quickly, are being used to tame dangerous floods across the capital. Residents are breeding millions of black soldier flies 
to consume garbage blocking drains across Nairobi and help keep streets and homes dry. So for more on this uh, very interesting story, Bloomberg's Andiro Ganga joins me now from Kigali. Uh, so interesting. Uh, talk to us about the breeding of these flies and, and uh, what the farmers intend to achieve. It feels novel in some ways, but also very basic. Jumana, what you said is absolutely correct. Nairobi has been grappling with flooding and um, there are flash floods that are increasing by the day. Houses submerged up to the roof, so they need an alternative solution. And this project is exactly to do that. So what they're doing is they're testing to see the correlation between properly managing their waste and seeing if it can help with the flooding. So this is a project, pilot project um, that has 10 farms and they'll be breeding this um, um, black soldier flies um, over a period of time and 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 the project has actually started it's a flagship project and you know the farmers walk around the neighborhoods they go around collecting waste from the neighborhoods 80 percent of the waste that is collected is organic waste then they go back to their farms they grind it they add um, um, reagents such as molasses such as probiotics and syrups to sweeten it and the lovers begin eating this this mixture and over a period of 14 days they grow from a size of rice to the size of a fingernail and they leave behind nutrient dense um, organic manure that can be sold to farmers so this is offering an alternative solution and they're hoping that these businesses can break even in the near term so they can cover their own operational costs and they can also create businesses for young Kenyans yeah it just feels like a, a low cost and clean way to deal with some of those issues but uh, what are, are some of the long-term benefits uh, do the flies uh, offer amid the battle with climate change Waste management is a big problem in Nairobi. Out of the 2,500 tons that they generate every single day, only a third of that is collected. You take a slum like Mukuru, where this project is situated, nearly 500,000 people live there and they do not get regular waste collection. So this is a project that can aid in proper waste management in the country. If you also look at flooding, again, it's been a big issue in Kenya. One, because some of this waste ends up in drainage pipes, clogging them, some of it ends up in rivers. So um, this could be an alternative. Also, it's just important to mention that the drainage in Nairobi was not built to cater to the current population. And this is not just a problem in Nairobi. Flooding has become a global problem. Hong Kong, London, um, Dubai, even Kenya. And, you know, New York estimated that they'll be needing at least $1 billion annually for the next 30 years in order to manage and upgrade their stormwater systems. This is a substantial amount of investment. And so a project like this just becomes an alternative tool in the toolbox in managing waste and also flooding. Yeah, absolutely. Bloomberg's Zandira Ganga, thank you so much for the report. Well, coming up, South Africa's central bank cuts interest rates for the first time since 2020. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Horizons Middle East and Africa. I'm Jumana Versace in Dubai. South Africa's central bank has cut interest rates for the first time in four years as it signaled a more optimistic outlook for inflation. The MPC decided to reduce the policy rate by 25 basis points to 8% per annum with effect from the 20th of September. In discussing the stance, MPC members considered an unchanged stance a 25 basis point cut and a 50 basis point cut. For more on this, we bring in Danny Lee Masia, South Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa Chief Economist at Deutsche Bank and Bloomberg's Chief Africa Correspondent Jennifer Zavazaja also joining the conversation. Uh, so Danny Lee, just looking at yesterday's decision, it was unanimous, 25 basis point cut. So it feels like all members of the committee wanted to go for that 25. And yet we just heard from the governor now and he was saying even a 50 basis point cut was suggested uh, by perhaps a few members of, of the committee. How should we read that? Thank you very much, Jamana. And yes, good morning to everyone. It's good to see um, the Reserve Bank finally getting off the mark with that 25 basis point cut. Mm -hmm. I think the context of uh, the discussions need to be framed amid the uncertainty that we face. Uh, we know that the Fed had moved by 50 basis points and a couple of 
you know, days leading up to the Fed, of course, that debate was quite strong. And I think it is uh, just prudent for the Reserve Bank to have a really rigorous discussion around some of the risks that we have seen, both on growth but also on inflation. Uh, they discussed 50. I don't think anybody voted for 50, so we have to make that distinction quite clear. Uh, they also discussed a whole position, uh, but they decided in the end that 25 basis points reduction is more prudent. And what they mentioned there, which I think is really important, is that it will help them to get inflation down more sustainably uh, to the midpoint or slightly below the midpoint where it is forecast to be at right now. So uh, what it does at least frames the conversations for analysts to see that or to say rather that they're more likely to be measured and the chances of them pushing towards a 50 basis point cut might really uh, necessitate more urgent conditions that we do not currently foresee right now. And Dana Lee, this is Jennifer in Johannesburg. I, I, I want to just get into, we were just looking at a chart there uh, of the rand and dollar cross. What's been interesting for us here in the newsroom is looking at just uh, the ascent of the rand uh, over the past few days. I think we saw it hit uh, a high that it hasn't seen since February February of 2023. How much of, of potentially the currency uh, do you think was factored into Kanyaho's tone and wanting to maybe protect the ascent that we're seeing right now? Yes, Jennifer, I think that's a very good uh, starting point. Uh, typically, what they do is they take around the three-month uh, average uh, for the RAND in a starting point, just to smooth out some of that volatility. So the starting point for uh, the RAND in the model is about 18.05. So there is still some room there for buffer should we reverse back to those levels. And like you have said, we've seen some of this volatility play out. Uh, but I do not think that that necessarily filters through into other parts of the, the model. For example, oil prices, they're still forecasting at around 80 or above 80. We're currently sitting well closer to 70 with the risks, as I've mentioned, could be geopolitical, could be uh, global growth related. Oil prices and the RAND combined can give us significant further re relief on fuel prices. And then uh, another point uh, worth mentioning related to the currency is that I see the Saab has not quite filtered through yet the latest level of food inflation. So in the latest food inflation print, we had food inflation drop to 4.1%. However, the Reserve Bank still has a 4.7% forecast as a starting point for the third quarter. Now, that means further reductions are quite possible. How they then ultimately square this up come November, I don't think that turns them towards a more dovish stance. Uh, because they very clearly stated that they're going to be looking through uh, these uh, kind of uh, normalization, the base effects washing, washing out. And I do know from earlier conversations that they also look at how other banks are currently performing, uh, looking at central banks such as Brazil recently having to hike. Other central banks um, in Europe are already starting to see inflation pressures move up. So I think all in all, really, the currency can dictate a little bit of wins for us here. We have, for example, cut um, our or, or revised really our rate cut um, cycle to 75 basis points. It's still below what the market has. Maybe if the rand is sustained at these sort of levels, we could see 100 basis points in, in total in, in, in the cycle. But again, the, the, the issue really here is that it will be measured, in my opinion. And Danny Lee, let's just zoom out to uh, broader sub-Saharan Africa because we will get other central bank decisions, namely Nigeria, which has uh, in and of itself been dealing with a number uh, of currency issues itself. Uh, I mean, do you think following the events that we've seen globally from central banks uh, that potentially Nigeria follows suit or, or decides to uh, potentially hold given some of the other risks that, that they're dealing with? It looks like uh, we're finally starting to see inflation cool down, uh, but these are still really high levels. I mean, this week's Nigeria's inflation rate still surprised us at above 32%. It peaked at four, uh, just above 34%. And I think there's some evidence to suggest here that uh, some of the pressures are easing, but I think it's predominantly base effects. The harvest is helping as well, uh, at least to give some relief to food inflation. 
But at the other end of the spectrum, we've got the Naira that consistently showing this upward pressure on, uh, you know, liquidity constraints that uh, that that the economy is faced with. So even though inflation is expected to cool from here, it's still going to remain quite high. And what we are seeing is a still significant cost push through the core inflation profile. There are elements that are very uh, closely linked to the FX market in, in, in uh, Nigeria. The education prices, for example, is, is, is a critical one. Whenever there's a shortage, we find services tend to actually pass through these costs quite rapidly. So I must say I might be out of consensus here, but I still think that is a case for the CBA next week to be hiking perhaps by a 25 basis point uh, move. I think consensus seemed to be gathering around an unchanged stance given this improvement, but I don't think Nigeria is out of the woods yet. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's a good place to leave it. Danny Lee, thank you so much for joining us today on the show. Danny Lee Masia, South uh, Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa Chief Economist at Deutsche Bank. And, of course, our very own uh, Bloomberg Chief Africa Correspondent Jennifer Zabazaja from Johannesburg. All right, well, we are capping off a week of gains, a solid week for equities. And this is what uh, the futures market are looking like right now. Of course, the S&P is coming off its 39th record high of the year, but now tilting somewhat towards the red, down a tenth of a percent. NASDAQ also dipping a little bit lower, down about 14 basis points. But of course, in yesterday's session, we ended up two and a half percent higher for the day. And this is what U.S. Treasuries are doing. Ten-year yield sitting around 3.71. And don't forget that right after that decision came out, we ended up selling off 10 basis points on the day as the market looks to further easing from the Fed. But that was Horizons Middle East and Africa. I'm Jamana Bersacci in Dubai. Stay with us for Daybreak Europe. This is Bloomberg.